it. You want to keep it slow bleeding uh, because they were, but not too intense because in that rate, the Ukrainians could uh, continue to arm. Uh, the Americans and Europeans could send whatever they wanted. So it was a good good situation. That's why they also want a stalemate at the front line. Keep the, keep it bleeding. Uh, yeah. And this has also been my assumption. As long as you can keep the bleeding without the front lines moving, it's a good war, as Stoltenberg and all the neocons uh, refer to it. Yeah. Uh, well, but, uh, but of course, if there's huge territorial conquest towards the west of Ukraine, uh, that, 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 that could also be a, a fall trap for the, for yeah. the Russians. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I'm again joined by Dr. Glenn Deason, who's a professor at the University of Southeast Norway and an associate editor at the journal Russia in Global Affairs. His research focuses on Russian foreign policy and political economy. And most of you here will know him well because he's also on a lot of other podcasts together with Alexander Mercury's interviewing uh, Mr. Mirsheimer and uh, Lena Petrova. And uh, well, Glenn just has a lot of very sensible things to say. And today we want to do something a little bit special. We want to think about what if, which we don't usually do. But I watched one of his uh, recent podcasts together with uh, John Mirsheimer and Alex Mercury's. And you were talking about the the development of the war and uh, in, between Ukraine and Russia and how this is going really, really badly at the moment for the Ukrainians and just how it is also uh, insane to still follow the old European, the, the EU NATO narrative of, uh, you know, um, first Russia is failing, then it's a, stall, a stalemate. And it occurred to me that what if, what if actually the neocons in the United States are on the same page as we are. And I want to lay this out for just a second. Um, Glenn, before, before we take this, uh, or before I give the microphone to you, um, what, would, what do we know by now about, these, about the neocons? We know that they are a fairly small circle of elites in the US um, responsible for decision-making um, in the Democratic Party, but also within the Republicans. And they are, they are fairly small. And the, the Obamas, the Clintons, the Pelosi's, we know that they're insanely powerful because they're able to even get rid of a, uh, presidential, a sitting presidential candidate. We know that these people have the highest offices and have the best, um, must have access to the best intel that empire can buy. These people um, might make mistakes, but they go through trial and error. And the Vietnam War in that sense is just an error. It's not, an, it's not, it's not terminal. Nothing, no war that the US ever lost is terminal because the one who really lost the Vietnam War, that was South Vietnam. Uh, or you didn't win Afghanistan or you left after 20 years, but then you continue going on and on. And we know that millions of dead people are not a problem to them because let's remember Madeleine Albright's worth it. Right. So this is a, it's a very, very bizarre mindset. And what if, in fact, these people are on the same page with us? Um, Glenn, first of all, welcome again after this. And um, what, what are your thoughts? Oh, it's uh, yeah, good to see you again. Oh, it's uh, it, it's a big question. What's happening within uh, Washington, of course, now, uh, and, and this is a puzzle and it's interesting because, um, you know, in most, uh, uh, research one looks for puzzles. And in this one, of course, I think it becomes from the available facts, the war has obviously been lost. Uh, it's, uh, well, going from bad to worse and you, you can measure this in different ways. And uh, we can go into details why it's going from bad to worse so quickly as well, but, uh, surely it would be in the interest of uh, Washington and to put an end to this, to uh, yeah, to start negotiations. And but still, what what we often hear is this: uh, you know, Ukraine can still win, it's, or it's actually winning, or it can be turned around uh, if we just have a little bit more time. You know, we, so something can happen. But uh, sometimes, of course, there's many who buy into this propaganda. And indeed, when whenever one speaks to people who has a foot uh, in Washington, they they kind of confirm this as well that um, you know many people 
either not informed or you know they're just buying to the uh, propaganda they've been spinning themselves but uh, but beyond 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 this it's also worth noting that there are also those people who are rational and as you say they can see what is happening as well that they see this, this destruction of the ukrainian army and this whole uh, narrative which they've been you know what we've been talking about for two and a half years is for a very small amount of money we get to decimate the uh, russian army with this killing russians destroying their equipment undermining their economy and it's a uh, it's uh, without fighting with americans so it's yeah, it, 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 there's no downsides to this war, effectively. Uh, as, as you said, obviously, dead Ukrainians uh, isn't very high on their priority lists in terms of what they're worried about. Um, so so it, it begs the question whether or not there is an interest to keep this war actually going. Because often we assume that there is an interest to, you know, let's have stability, some return of peace. Uh, but why? Why? Uh, uh, a, a lot of the models we've seen over the past uh, 20 years hasn't favored it. Uh, we would, they knew as well that the war was being lost in Afghanistan, as we learned from the Afghanistan paper. But they, they did the same as they do in Ukraine. They keep saying, we're winning, we're winning, you know, until they're uh, running off. And this same in Iraq. It's, uh, they, some people behind the scenes, they know what's happening. They, they can see this and... Uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it is interesting that it doesn't appear to affect the policy, which then begs the question: if there is some rational thought here, what what is the actual uh, interest? Precisely, and what is the interest as the the realities on the battleground shift? Because we are the propagandized masses, right? And the one thing we learned is we cannot trust a single thing that comes from these newspapers. Um, none of us. I mean, a lot of these newspapers is full of either garbage that is not, that is irrelevant or garbage that is supposed to make us think something is happening that's actually actively not happening, right? Um, now, but on the other hand, we also know that the, the people, some people have like access to extremely good uh, in, in intelligence. Now, the, the, the goal at the beginning of this war was obviously to break Russia's backbone, right? And that's why the, the NATO didn't react to these two draft treaties that were sent to them in December 2021. They didn't, they didn't pick up Russia on this whole offer, let's make new, um, U Ukraine neutral. Even worse, when Russia actually invaded with too few, too few troops to make it a real invasion, you had then... Uh, um, the, the Russian strategy was to force the Ukrainians to the negotiating table, and they had them almost, almost to the point where they signed. And then the West intervened and said, there's no neutrality, you have to fight. And Ukraine did that. And we, we put the sanctions and so on, we're going to break your back. That didn't happen. And then the whole thing transformed into a war of attrition, where the Russian goal was, and many, I mean, Alexander Mercury and so on, they have been saying that from a very early point. This is not about territory anymore. This is about demilitarizing Ukraine with, with uh, weapons and demilitarizing NATO through, through fighting there, right? And they have achieved that. But now we are at a point where Russia is about to win, but win in the sense of actually being able to, to uh, expel the Ukrainian forces from this territory of land. So if you were a neocon, and if you actually were aware of all of that, and you don't believe the propaganda, what would be the next logical step? We have heard from Hillary Clinton, who said we could transform uh, Ukraine, we could make it an Afghanistan for the uh, Afghanistan of Europe, you know, a 20 year horrible war with like guerrilla war fighting and force the, uh, you know, force the, the, Russian, the, the Russians to basically occupy this territory and keep fighting and keep losing men little by little, even if the Ukrainians lose more. Don't you think that there's a serious danger that the way that Russia was baited into actually a full-scale invasion in February 2022, that they're now being baited into believing that they're winning when in fact the, U the, the, West, the neocons want to make them sw uh, swallow a poison pill? Uh, it it uh, it is a good point uh, whether or not uh, it would be in the U.S. interest to some extent uh, that they would actually cross uh, the 
the Dnieper because um, it's, you know, well, to just take it back to 2014 when uh, after NATO countries toppled the government in, in Ukraine, uh, at that point, Putin made the decision to take back Crimea. Uh, and and uh, he, but a lot of the others in the Russia, the nationalists, and all they were putting a lot of pressure. So, in, you know, how about Donbass, uh, all these areas? which obviously will be attempted to be de-Russified and, uh, well, NATO-fied, if you will, uh, it, we should go there as well to liberate them, uh, as they would frame it. Now, the, the main reason why they didn't was obviously uh, be, because, you know, wh where would you stop uh, if you if you take, you know, Donbass? Uh, what about uh, Saporozhye? Where are they going to be left out? So there's no natural cutoff point. So, and the further west you go, the more hostility, uh, local hostility, there is the the Russians would meet. Obviously, in in the Crimea, they're met with flowers. In uh, Donbas, they also have very solid, uh, a lot of support enough at least to set up local governments, uh, which are uh, favorable of Russia and you know a much sympathy in the population. But the further west you go, once you reach the western parts of Ukraine, they can't find a single person who wants them there. So then you have more. Uh, a prospect for guerrilla warfare and uh, it, it, again it, it's worse and this is why also Putin wanted to limit himself to Crimea because it's a it's a peninsula it's a, the, it's a clear cut where you want to uh, cut off the, the geography also because this is uh, the, the key naval base of the Russians in the Black Sea this is the big price this is what the Americans really want uh, this is why Crimea is so important to kick the Russians out of the Black Sea, to a large extent, is what the war is also about. Um, but uh, but so, anyways, the the for, for the Russians, they they have an interest to stay where they are now because what was historically Russian territory that is from Kharkov to Odessa, this is the historical Russian territory where they have the language, culture, uh, ethnic Russians, and uh, first of all, there they have seen they. Uh, at least their population see themselves as having somewhat a mandate to protect this region. But it's uh, also a very important region uh, in terms of this is where the energy is, this is where the uh, natural resources, the lithium, which the Europeans are <laughs> becoming more and more uh, aware of, uh, if not vocal. Uh, there are, this is where the fertile black soil is for the agriculture, the heavy industry, and of course the entire Black Sea coast of Ukraine. So all the all the spoils of war, if you will, is in this area. But if there's no peace and the Russians move beyond the Dnieper, of course, they would uh, uh, they would end up in territories which are very hostile, uh, but uh, also of, of little significance. And I'm thinking that uh, yeah, well, well, it, it, rather than agreeing to peace with the Russians within where Russia maintains some presence uh, at least of some of the territories in these historical parts of Russia in the east of Ukraine um, it's uh, whether or not it's a greater interest of the United States to have more perpetual war with the uh, if, if the Russians would actually end up in no not that they would want to give up the western part of Ukraine but have a peace where Russia gets part of eastern Ukraine or perpetual war where the Russians are bogged down in the east, uh, sorry, in the west of Ukraine. I think that the latter might be more in their interest. And you cited Hillary Clinton, and it's worth noting this is not recent. This is um, once uh, at the time during the Istanbul peace agreements, when the Ukrainians and Russians, as you point out correctly, were close to a peace agreement. Uh, what we then saw was, uh, uh, well, as is available now, um, the, the Americans and the British came and sabotaged this piece. Now, this is this was the point in time when Hillary Clinton made uh, interviews and she was saying that, well, uh, consensus was forming in Washington that the, the best model was the Afghanistan model. So, in other words, uh, tie the Russians into a huge uh, swamp, uh, just drain their energy, their blood, the equipment, money, and... Uh, uh, and over, over time, uh, just severely weakened them. Uh, now, one can argue why the Europeans would go along with this, given that uh, we now created an, an, Af an Afghanistan in the middle of our own continent, uh, which would obviously rub off of economic strength, uh, political relevance, ec security. Uh, this is obvious that, uh, that this would uh, end up very bad for Europe. But anyways, uh, this is 
uh, th th this would fit with the model of why would you have peace in eastern Ukraine when you can uh, prolong it, uh, especially as all these American leaders keeps telling us over and over again, but we don't uh, seem to listen, uh, you know, that this is a good war. This is yeah. uh, great opportunities. And uh, uh, just, uh, I don't want to go on too long, but uh, you should read the, the peace proposal uh, by Pompeo was in the Wall Street Journal a few days ago. It's eff effectively, this is the same, um, this is the same goal as saying, listen, let's, uh, our peace should be include like a half a trillion dollar lend lease uh, for for Ukraine. Again, this goes on the peace plan, by the way, uh, and and it's great because uh, uh, this is weapons. Uh, well, you, the U.S. gets to sell a lot of weapons, not just to the Ukrainians, but to the rest of the Europeans. So the U.S. will build up its in, in, in military industrial base, its ability to yeah, produce all this weaponry, and. Uh, and uh, not only the arms manufacturing doing well, but with this land lease, the Ukrainians have to pay also in their resources. Uh, all of these weapons, are, of course, going to weaken a strategic rival, which is the which is Russia. By perpetuating this war, uh, uh, you will have a NATO revived again. Pompeo also said new purpose for NATO. And uh, lastly, I would say, well, this wasn't explicitly said, but implicit, the, as long as this war continues, the, not just the Ukrainians, but the Europeans will remain very loyal and obedient. And this is great in a time of economic rivalry with countries like China, because you don't want countries to go out and suddenly diversify their economic partnerships and uh, uh, yeah, trade with the Chinese on, especially on strategic industries which the U.S. are competing with. So there's a lot of benefits to keeping this war going. And so w why would you end it? Precisely, precisely, and that's the thing where I am worried that uh, the the reason the there's a lot of talk in certain corners of the internet that you know now the, the war is going to be over because Russia is winning. And I've heard that actually I was on one or. Uh, uh, Cross talk episode with with uh, on RT and behind the stage when we were done, like the moderator, I forgot his name, Peter Peter something. He he Lavel Lavel. When when the cameras went off, he said like, "Oh, gentlemen, isn't it great to be on the right side of history?" And I'm like, "Well, you have to be careful. This is the kind of this is the kind of uh, triumphalism." that can get you into very deep trouble if you also as a country start believing that now we now we're done we we go there. Um, because there are all of these reasons for the Americans um, and for NATO to uh, to use this situation, because Ukraine to them doesn't matter whether it's whether it's half a million dead Ukrainians, a million, two million, or ten million. As long as there are Ukrainians who can die and there's nothing they can do, then they will send these people, right? Or they will they will they will use the chaos that that would uh, ensue in order to further their goals. And there's this false narrative around as well that, oh, $35 trillion debt, it's so horrible. This debt is US dollar debt. This is the US economy. The 35 trillion US dollar debt is 35 trillion US dollar assets for the, for the dollar economy. Um, and the, all, of, all of the weapons bought are bought in US dollars and they are obviously supporting the US economy. The, economy, the US economy is booming and the MIC is booming. Um, this has a lot of upsides for 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 the U.S. and as you said, the um, the 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 continuation. There's very good arguments for that. The question is whether they're able to force the Europeans and especially the Ukrainians to go along with them. But if they do, because there are no other options available anymore, well, then force the Russians to cross the Dnieper, keep send, keep firing the weapons and keep even uh, firing at Belgorod and so on, force them to go further and use more and more of their forces, right? Isn't that a serious danger that, that, um, that this might turn, that this might become the meat grinder for the Russians in the end? Well, there should definitely be careful if, uh, about the prospect of being lured into something because uh, I, I remember I, I went a few times to Russia in, in 2022 and and this was the sentiment by many because uh, when when they went into Ukraine in February of 2022 uh, their main goal was just to show extreme military force you know rush uh, rush in and then uh, as we also had confirmed on the first day of the invasion, contact uh, Zelensky and start renegotiations uh, negotiations 
because they never got the Minsk agreement through. And uh, also, as our media never tells us, on the third day, uh, Zelensky and uh, Putin agreed to this. Uh, they were going to start negotiations. So, so definitely this was the purpose now. Uh, but that they had assumed that that's what the Americans wanted as well, or the West, that they didn't want a huge conflict war with Russia. But that's where they were wrong. And this is proven to be wrong. Uh, again, the Israelis, the Turks, all the mediators, the, 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 the Russian side, the Ukrainian side, everyone has now confirmed that the, the, the Americans uh, deliberately push to sabotage or, or to cancel torpedo this entire peace agreement so so that's why the russians thought oh we got uh, fu fooled into this and uh, now they were in a perpetual war which would uh, uh, just gradually drain uh, russia and this is also why it was important for uh, R russia to increase the warfare to a huge extent which is why it's so intense because the russians can scale they can uh, in increase and uh, w what we now see is in a war of attrition when the ukrainians are being depleted they they could you know replace uh, 100 200 troops a day but now we're having casualties uh, uh, between 1000 and 2000 a day uh, they, they they can't replace the the nato can't create enough weaponry the ukrainians can't mobilize enough people so this is scaling is why why russia this is the only way russia could win it sounds grotesque but uh, but this is the war we're in. We told the Russians, here's a war. Either you capitulate, or means you pull out, and uh, NATO will go in. Otherwise, uh, we're gonna go on forever. And uh, you know, this is why we don't have negotiations. That's why we don't have diplomacy. So yeah, and and we know that NATO is not willing to go in in itself. So they are not that suicidal. But they are. The thing is. Um, if I was a neocon and if I was co confronted with that, then my strategic uh, calculus would be to tell the Ukrainians, OK, guys, you've been fighting a symmetric war so far. Smaller army against a bigger army, fine, but it's been symmetrical on the, on the battlefield. Let's change that. We'll make it asymmetrical. You guys fall back. Uh, you form guerrillas. You start these pinprick attacks once the, once the Russians come in. You force them to take over Kiev. Um, civilians are just another form of potential fighters in, in this war. Um, we're going to organize this kind of um, uh, civil defense in the underground, which actually then is completely against all humanitarian law because it would eradicate the barrier between civilians and, and, uh, um, and military personnel. But that's, I mean, that could be on the, on, on the cards, right? To just transform this into something absolutely a, a, a hell pit. For Russia to occupy. Yeah, and this is also the the, the the dilemma for Russia because if they want to defeat Ukraine, they have to continue to move inwards. Mm -hmm. uh, but as they also discovered when they went into places like Kherson or Saporozhye, they uh, you know why, why if you're going to run these regions and have the proper logistics and uh, well everything you need. Uh, cooperation at the local level among the population but why would local people support you uh, in occupation if you're planning to leave later on uh, so so this is was also a good argument or a strong argument at least in russia why why they should uh, annex these areas because if they're saying this is russian territory we will always defend it it's easier to recruit uh, a local government to work for you uh, but anyways the more um, the, the more the more territory they take the more unattractive any peace agreement will be to the Ukrainians. And uh, it's a little bit well, what the initial fear of Russia was. The further west they go, the, uh, the, yeah, the, the more locked in they will be, the more harder it will be to, uh, yeah, to, to create a new acceptable status quo. Uh, so I, I think, uh, yeah, that, that you're probably correct that uh, the, this hubris that, uh, yes, now we defeated uh, Ukraine, uh, there has to be th some thoughts what what the peace should look like because yeah. uh, well, because Russia's also t tied itself a bit now down because it annexed these territories how it can't um, there's some things it can't uh, negotiate on anymore and that's why I want to go back to 2022 with the Istanbul agreement this is what uh, everyone uh, confirmed the which was Russia was willing even the negotiators on the Ukrainian side that kind of confirmed the Russians were willing to negotiate on everything they were willing to pull back all their troops to where they had been uh, before the invasion, uh, everything. The only thing they needed was the territorial. Now it was uh, restoring neutrality. And, uh, and and they couldn't get that. And as a result, now it has become a conflict of territory. 
And this is also great for NATO because now NATO can say, listen, we, we can't have negotiations because that entails giving away Ukrainian territory. So this is what negotiations is now. This is not what it used to be. This is what, <laughs> this was not, uh, you know, we had Minsk, uh, we had uh, uh, the negotiations 2021, we had the Istanbul Agreement territorial, uh, uh, the handing of territory was never part of those negotiations. But now, after two years, we can say, well, territorial changes are unacceptable. So now we can't accept peace anymore. But isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. If the Russians winning the war is one thing, but then winning the peace, um, go and make sure that you can have again an, uh, a life with the Ukrainians, right? Um, so, and in a, in a sense, the Russians actually also boxed themselves in to some extent, to, to some, in some sense, because they made it very clear, we will only negotiate while still conducting the war. We're not going to give you a, a ceasefire because we know that you want to use that in order to replenish your, your forces and so on. So that's what we did two years ago. We're not going to do it this time. But that also means that you have to continue to fight, right? So if tomorrow these lines break or the, the, the Ukrainians withdraw, like, extensively what would the russians do <laughs> that would be a problem wouldn't it i mean yeah you can go in with your tanks but you're going to lose yourself in this huge vast territory i mean i'm sure the russian russian strategists must must have been thinking about this i just wouldn't know what 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 you would do in such a situation yeah and this is a disadvantage why the, the war has become a conflict of of, uh, of territory as well so uh yeah, it's, it's, it's also a huge problem for Russia because I, ideally the way uh, when, when they set the um, when they set the goal of the war, they said denazification was one of them. Now with that, of course, it means expelling a lot of the um, the far right uh, of people. fascist groups, the of people out of the influence they had in government because the Americans helped to put them in there for the exact reason that they would have veto power that the Ukrainians would not uh, do any peace agreement. Indeed, this is one of the reasons why Zelensky is not pursuing peace. Uh, so, and this is still the same idea that uh, Ukraine needs another government. Uh, so, but it's still not impossible. It's uh, if things goes from bad to worse, uh, Zelensky holds on and continues to well seem to only take orders from Washington. There is a lot of concern in the Ukrainian military that. Uh, uh, not Zelensky has not only been fighting PR wars, but that is also a bit too obedient to the Americans. That um, you know there could be some pushback where the military would uh, put in someone different. Again, the Russians don't need anyone necessarily pro-Russian, but they need someone they can work with, and uh, you know these are two different things. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's it's still possible, but the situation uh, in terms of as as the war gets better and better, the the, the peace becomes more less so and this is the thing you can't just crush someone and um, you, you, you would like to have some peace arrangement which could be acceptable uh, for both sides so this whole idea that Russia wants to conquer all of Ukraine this has been very at the center of um, you know in the west of our propaganda in our war narrative but this is uh, this of course this is uh, fake but nonetheless this is uh, exactly what russia wouldn't want going into western ukraine would be a complete disaster uh, at least now you have many people in western ukraine if you listen to the protests they have their complaints is why are we sending all our young men dying in the east of ukraine they don't they don't they don't speak ukrainian they're not uh, like us uh, you know they don't even uh, you know this was one of the big complaint that uh, in donbass uh, a lot of the locals were giving up the positions to of the ukrainians to the russians so they're saying why are we dying for these people they're they're muscovites you know they're not one of us so but if the russians bring the war to the western part you know it could revive the <laughs> revive the war as well so i i think uh, yeah i think it's uh, uh, yeah, hubris can be a dangerous thing. It was for us and it will be for the Russians as well. I mean, the, the best case scenario is that Ukraine gains more agency in this entire, in this entire game because at, at least for the moment, it looks as if though a good part of the Ukrainian political process is very much captured either by foreign influence or by ultra-right-wing you know, uh, uh, nationalist influence of the Azov type 
who, who keep pushing, pushing, pushing for more war. But that's where the ultra right wing uh, coincides with a lot of the interest from the United States, which is why we see the cooperation, right? Because they actually push in the same direction. It's the hawks, the hawks that cooperate, even at the at the danger of destroying the entire nation, right? And and we are close to that to that moment in, in, in Ukraine. But again, these people think it's worth it for two different reasons, but they think it's worth it. And if they continue thinking that, then wouldn't the, the, the natural next step be to, well, okay, we're gonna accept this reality and then we're, we're gonna transform it into guerrilla warfare. And as long as we have open borders and we manage to get in and smuggle in enough weapons and, and cash and, and, and so on, even if the, the, the Russians are nominally in charge of Kiev and so on, there's no way of keeping that out. You cannot keep, you cannot even keep the weapons out of Gaza. So the, the, yeah. it's, 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 it's insane if we think about this, how, you know, territorial control, complete territorial control is almost impossible to, to assert, even if you're Israel against Gaza. So the Ukrainians, even under occupation against the Russians, I mean, this is, um, this might, and this might actually bleed Russia dry. Yeah, and this is why it's an, it could be an interest to to intensify the war by pulling the Russians into Western Ukraine. Because keep yeah. in mind, yeah. at the moment, there's a lot of resistance emerging in, in Ukraine, which wants to find a deal. Look at uh, a great example is Alexei Rostovich, who was the former advisor of, uh, of uh, Zelensky. He lost his job when he was pointing out, well, what... Uh, what what was fact that some of these interceptive missiles, uh, which Ukraine had uh, launched at Russia, landed on these uh, apartment buildings? So this is when he lost his job. Anyways, um, my 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 point is he's now arguing that uh, that uh, they should you know maybe recognize reality that uh, not just continue to throw men to die in this war, which can't be won. And what's nice about him for the Russians is he's not a pro-Russian by any stretch of the imagination, but he is pro-reality. And so he's kind of, he's going out and saying, listen, if I was uh, in Russia, if I was advising the Russians, I would advise to do exactly what they're doing, uh, to have a Ukraine uh, which accommodates NATO on its territory. It's uh, it's an uh, unacceptable threat to the Russians. They will... They will look after their own security, and that means uh, pummeling Ukraine. And he ad he addresses this reality as not not to cheer on the Russians as we would demonize it in the West, but but simply to formulate a good policy, saying, "Listen, we have to take a step back from this because uh, we're incentivizing the Russians to do what they're doing now. So we have to find a peace and a step away from this." So again, this is a person that Russians could work with. So that's someone I'm right. not advocating for Stovich because he's an opportunist, no. But but yep. this is the kind of well, they might want to get in someone they they could work with at least who would look after a national interest instead of just uh, because it's very hard to convince me that any of this is in Ukraine's interest. But is he real? That's the question because we know now if, if the the West is maybe not good at manufacturing weapons, but it is a master in manufacturing narratives. And part of the narrative structure that the West has mastered is controlled opposition uh, and controlled counter narratives. Uh, Arestovich, because one of the things is he's free. He's in Ukraine. He says all of these things and he's not in prison. <laughs> he's not he's not part of the people who Zelensky really fights against. Uh, uh, and we've seen that we see this in other theaters as well. There's this entire the Gaza war for the last six months. There's this controlled counter narrative of we're close to a brokered uh, peace yeah. deal. We're close to a peace deal. Oh, Blinken is again there. Oh, we're working for peace. And we know it's utter nonsense. This is just make believe in order to sw have people swallow for another couple of weeks that, OK, so we have a war, but at least somebody is working toward it. And if Aristovich and so on are the same thing inside Ukraine towards the Ukrainian people, then they're just part of the system that is going to uh, that is designed to keep the whole tragedy going in in the favor of those lunatic bloodthirsty neocons yeah no uh, well obviously in, in israel that's very very, very correct it's, it's easier to pretend you're working on a peace rather than telling the public to stop complaining while we're doing this genocide uh, and also given that this is also u.s genocide obviously it's it's uh, it's easier to pretend as if uh, you're actually trying to restrain them. Uh, besides, you know, as long as it doesn't mean 
uh, sending fewer weapons. Uh, but yeah, it, it, I'm not going to um, dismiss the possibility that uh, uh, Arstovich is a controlled opposition, but but this sentiment that uh, this is uh, this war isn't going our way, we have to find a different path. You you have this uh, sentiment which uh, could be expressed through 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 some uh, opposition now. Um, but uh, again, this is why I think if you're in the United States, what would you do to counter it? Uh, be, uh, how would you try to prevent uh, this peace from breaking out? Because keep keep in mind, they've they, they done this all along with when Poroshenko was uh, elected in, in Ukraine. Uh, he, he, you know, parliament there, majority voted for implementing Minsk. Then you had American uh, fascist groups who put uh, engaged in enough violence for parliament to reverse it. So they didn't implement it. And they did the same with Zelensky. They, again, he won on the peace platform in uh, in 2019. And then what happened? Yeah, the same uh, also fascist groups uh, backed by the United States began to threaten him until he reversed himself as well. So this is so th this is why I think the the basics of what well, what could prevent a peace is well, well, why would it be in the interest of the United States if we recognize this is the main actor? And and I think if you want to look at some of the thinking in the U.S., uh, I think you're yeah you're probably also familiar with this Rand report from 2019. Yeah. It's uh I, I would advise everyone to read it because it's in it has the title extending Russia. It's uh, written you know Rand is a think tank known for yeah the think tank of the intelligence agencies, and they wrote this in cooperation with the U.S. Uh, with the U.S. I forgot some some branch of the U.S. Army. And anyways, the whole goal was how to exhaust Russia, 300 pages. So everything, and it's great to read now, five years later, because it's everything that's been done since. So they have to prevent the export of natural resources. So then they mentioned Nord Stream over and over again. And they say we have to undermine the legitimacy of the Russian government, both domestic and abroad. They mentioned, you know, people that could help uh, on the inside. The Navalny is mentioned many times. How new weapon systems? Yes, it escalates uh, less security, but it drains Russian resources. They say, oh, we should fuel the conflict in Syria. This drains Russia. Regime change in Belarus, you know, which uh, almost happened the year after, uh, also destabilized South Caucasus. Uh, which, in which they then defined as Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. Georgia, now the prime minister has said this, they're warning, hey, listen, uh, the Americans through this, uh, you know, fake NGOs are trying to topple us to create a second front against the Russians. Uh, also, Azerbaijan, Armenia was attractive because Russia tried to good relations with both of them. If they end up in a conflict, then Russia has to pick one over the other or or do nothing and then lose its security credibility in Armenia, which was important to win them over. Uh, also diminish Russia's influence in Central Asia, uh, reduce its influence in Moldova, which is definitely something you're seeing now uh, at the cost of a huge repression of the political opposition, making it a little mini Ukraine. And of course, the big one was Ukraine. And that was the whole point. In this report, they they say different tactics. Well, as long as we threaten NATO expansion, as long as we keep uh, sending uh, weapons in, uh, this is again 2019, so three years before Russia invaded, um, it will slowly bleed the Russians. They will lose manpower. They will lose money. Uh, they will lose uh, yeah, their relationship with the Europeans. So this is what this is what you want for the United. If you're a part of this, uh, yeah. Uh, neocons in the United States. You want to keep it slow, bleeding, uh, because they were, but not too intense. Because in that rate, the Ukrainians could uh, continue to arm. Uh, the Americans and Europeans could send whatever they wanted. So it was a good, good situation. That's why they also want a stalemate at the front line. Keep the keep it bleeding. Uh, yeah. And this has also been my assumption. As long as you can keep the bleeding without the front lines moving, it's a good war, as Stoltenberg and all the neocons uh, refer to it. Yeah. Uh, well, but uh, but of course, if there's huge territorial conquest towards the west of Ukraine, uh, that, that 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 could also be a, a fall trap for the for yeah. the Russians. Yeah. So, and you know, there's a brand, there's a new Rand report out now uh, for the it's called Commission on the National Defense Strategy, where they again like lay out what they've learned, lessons learned, and one of the lessons actually is we we are not able to to produce enough weapons, so we need more weapons, we need more investment. Um, yeah, but, but sorry, also... just one thing that, that is Pompeo's peace plan. 
half a trillion in lend lease. The Ukrainians have to pay it back through you know res natural resources. And the Europeans, of course, have to guarantee some of this. And then you use all that money so you have the Europeans boost the uh, military industrial production of America and they can rebuild this, uh, what, what, what they lost, which is this huge uh, uh, yeah, ability to produce uh, to, um, uh, weapons. So this is, uh, sorry, this is, uh, this is the peace plan. Uh, very Orwellian term, uh, mm -hmm. use of the word peace, of course. But, but this means that for Russia... Russia is now in the position where it has to accomplish this almost Im the impossible, which is through fighting a war, defeating the war making plans of the US to continue fighting through Ukraine. So figure out a way to wrestle the political process away from the Americans inside Ukraine in order to, to, to uh, be able to to not go to not have to go down that route right so you need a war strategy to bring a peace to a population which is so highly antagonistic that i wonder how you do how how can you achieve this because at the end of the day war like peace are political processes and how do you how would you go about that <laughs> to wrestle ukraine away from the from the americans because otherwise they might just continue doing this. Yeah, and this is the this is the huge uh, problem because uh, what Russia's asking is a big ask because not only do they demand uh, Ukraine denounce NATO membership, but they also want de facto membership to be taken off the table. Keep in mind between 2014 and 19, you in 22 sorry during those eight years ukraine wasn't part of nato and it could have taken a long time before they would have been able to join but they were becoming a de facto nato member as uh, all these military experts said you know they're building all these uh, ports for american warships they're setting up all their cia bases uh, who do raids into russia along russian borders they were um, filling it up with a uh, nato weapon system so that they were becoming a uh, de facto NATO member state. And again, this is why uh, this is, uh, well, according to a former chief of uh, Russian analysis at CIA and the former um, advisor to the French president, they were, this is what they were saying in 2021, that all these new agreements between uh, NATO and Ukraine, especially the US-Ukraine uh, strategic partnership of November 2021 that this convinced Russia that this was the time they either know how to attack or be attacked. So they they saw, yeah, the, the de facto name NATO membership is problem. Anyways, <laughs> sorry, I go on, but my, 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 my main point is they have also have to call for Ukraine to decouple from all security cooperation with the West. Now, this is a huge ask after this country has now been completely slaughtered, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands probably now either injured or dead uh, as a result of the Russian invasion. And now they have to cut all security ties. Uh, you know, I, 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 think, I, I think it would be necessary for peace. And also I think they... Uh, mistook us for partners. I think we have used the Ukrainians to a huge extent. So I think this is a way to go, but it's very hard to sell that to the Ukrainian public and to the Ukrainian pol political system. Yeah, it's about selling. And the US and the West, the US is a, is a master at selling things. And um, I think Russia and China, they don't even come close to this kind of narrative power, right? And the so what you would need to sell is the idea that the West abused you and you will have a better future with us. Now agree and lay down the weapons and then prosper together, right? And then we'll, we'll, we'll make up, we'll make this up. But uh, if that happens, the very next day, the, the US will put the, all the Russia sanctions also on Ukraine, right? That's, that's when we will know that they have really lost the war, right? At the moment, the West put sanctions on Ukraine <laughs> because they know it's now part of the other camp because that's how these people think, right? It's, it's all or nothing. So unless they go to nothing, they still think they, they can have it all. Um, mm. Yeah, that was the amusing part in 2014 that uh, when the, the NATO said, oh, Russia annexed Ukraine. So we put sanctions uh, now we and uh, Russia next Crimea and uh, and they responded by putting harsh sanctions on Crimea shutting down swift within Crimea they didn't even do that to the rest of Russia or you know or Russia uh, but they did this to Crimea so 
If our, they will do yeah, that so, to Ukraine immediately. The second they lose Ukraine, they will actually put sanctions. So unless we have sanctions on Ukraine, we know that they will think it's not lost yet. Yeah, but this is how you mentioned good at selling. Look, look what they're doing in in Georgia. What 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 happened there? Uh, you know, they're also putting sanctions there after this uh, uh, after this yeah. law that they, they they pushed on the NGOs, even though. You know that's a very reasonable law, but but look what they had to do uh, overnight. You just show a lot of people protesting, saying, "Oh, here's the real Georgian people," and then you keep repeating on, on the um, on the news that, yeah. "Oh, the prime minister is actually a puppet of Putin." So this is the real Georgians. This is the puppet, right. and now we will put sanctions on them to save them. You know, go to Venezuela, Georgia. Doesn't matter where you go; it's always the same. It's script. always the same. But so it's, Georgia. It is, it is, yeah. Georgia is a good example because I just talked the other day with uh, with Lasha Kasratze and he told me, you know, that the population in Georgia, the, the majority is just not sold on it. They, they, they changed. In 2008, they believed that they could be part of NATO and so on. And then everything happened. And today, 16 years later, they just don't believe it anymore. So Georgia kind of had a mental shift. And that doesn't mean that they become pro-Russian. They, they, they're not. Uh, but they they became way more weary about being co- being used as attack dogs uh, and and sacrificed in the process. And a large part of the Georgian population, according to Lasha, understands that today. So they had that shift of mentality. The, then the question would be, how do you make that happen in Ukraine too, or or yeah, in order to to calm down this this disaster? Yeah, no, I I agree, and I think this is why. Um, if you put a label on it, uh, why they're getting more worried about being uh, European Kurds, effectively, because this is what they did with the Kurdish as well when they went uh, with the war in Iraq. Just promise them everything, uh, have them fight for you, and when you don't need them, you you, you pull back. This is uh, yeah, this <laughs> this is how this is how empires always fought. You don't want to fight with your own people; you fight with other peoples. This is uh, uh, yeah, history. Well, so Mark Twain, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. <laughs> this is, uh, yeah, well, some of this uh, is almost it, identical. It's but strategy I, and it's logic. Yeah. It, it That's what you would do if you were the other guys. But I uh, I would say on one thing, uh, that it might not be possible for or, or ideal for the United States to, to continue this. Because before you mentioned that the American economy was booming, but uh, yes, some some areas like the arms manufacturers, they're definitely booming. Uh, but in the United States, uh, there's huge economic problems coming. If uh, I, I would, uh, I think a lot is being hold, held back because uh, there's election time, but there's a huge crisis building up in the banking industry. They're gonna have a lot of economic problems going forward. And I think that this was, uh, uh, one of the flaws of this logic when Stoltenberg or this American leaders keep saying, oh, listen, for only a small percentage of your defense budget, you can uh, yeah, destroy uh, Russia's uh, or weaken Russia as a strategic adversary. Yes, correct to some extent, but this is a obsession with measuring everything only in GDP. But if you see, uh, and this was also, I noticed in this country, many people who are arguing who I talked to that, yeah, perhaps it was a good idea to uh, to use the Ukrainians a bit to weaken Russia, but lo- look at the wider implications. Uh, now Russia is uh, or reorienting its economy to the east. Uh, it's um, enabling effectively China to develop an alternative economic infrastructure, a multipolar one. Uh, you're having the rest of the world now flocking towards it. Uh, this is uh, you know resulting in decoupling from American technologies and industries. You're seeing the de-dollarization. This is. Uh, Something uh, yeah, would, would have been dismissed a few years ago. Now it's becoming a real, real concern. And uh, now you know, Malaysia's going to join in as well. It's just that they're losing uh, strategic uh, partners now. And uh, it's, um, I, 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 yeah, this BRICS, especially now, is worrying the Americans as well. So I think uh, this idea that you maintain a conflict with Russia when you also want to go to Asia, that the uh, they're pushing all their addresses together. That's uh, something has yeah. has to give. Of course, yeah, the goal that's... was let's knock out the Russians. Then we can take the Chinese. We'll go for everything. But the, but if that doesn't work, uh, I think it, it it isn't working. I think that the economic cost for the United States will be immense. Uh, but that's why uh, I'm so worried because all of this is rational and reasonable, and you and I we can understand it. And for you, you and I, this makes zero sense. But these people think in 
they, they think in black and white and they overestimate their own power tremendously. But that still leads them down the path of these very poor choices <laughs> and these very bloodthirsty choices. And uh, they, un until and unless they lose political power, they will, they, will, they will argue for that. And the problem with their political power is it's not one of the two parties. It's both parties and the, the administration, right, that, that they capture yeah. at, certain, at certain places. Yeah. And this is also why I feel, well, I, I don't think there's necessarily some great um, you know, evil plan behind everything. Yeah. Everything is calculated in the U.S. because... Uh, I, I think it's more likely that no one's behind the wheel anymore, or yeah. at least there's too many special interests pulling in different directions. Uh, one of the problems said in Afghanistan, by the way, because, uh, well, uh, this, this idea was, uh, well, thought was reinforced uh, yesterday because me and Alexander Mercurius, we had this um, discussion with uh, Professor Theodore Postol. Um, uh, yeah, we spoke about before this recording, and he's a, uh, yeah, he's a MIT uh, nuclear engineer, uh, what was that? <laughs> my my world just collapsed. My world just yeah. came down. <laughs> Continue. World did come down. It's a bad omen. But anyways, what, what I was gonna say is, uh, yeah, this missile exp um, a missile expert uh, yeah, from MIT, but he also has this huge background from Pentagon. So it's quite interesting because he always asks for advice, be it you know Michael McFall or these people who are quite um, central in uh, in 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 pushing missile defense policies, all of this. Anyways, what his main argument was is when he talks to uh, the political elites, is um, that most of them, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're saying. And even when he was asked uh, by people like Michael McFaul, because he was the main one pushing missile defense, you know, very confidently saying why, why they wouldn't be able to negotiate with the Russians, how the system should be. And only from his questions, he said he, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't understand any of this, uh, any of this technology. So, uh, and, and this is something he said had degraded over years, uh, especially over the past yeah, 30 years, that uh, the expertise among the, the, the leadership is just uh, gone. It's uh, when they're communicating in slogans uh, and catchphrases, they, they seem to be thinking in slogans and catchphrases too. Uh, uh, they communicate less with uh, experts and they lean more on ideology and, uh, um, yeah, well, he just said incompetence. That was the main thing he got away. So, uh, anyways, I, th I fear that this is a, a key problem that uh, there's no, there's not that many rational. Uh, thinking anymore rather i think economic interest is a huge huge driver yeah, yeah. and um, yeah this was also the argument of uh, george kennan by the way at the, towards the end of the cold war he was pointing out that uh, you know if uh, the soviet union would sink into the sea tomorrow and the cold war would be over uh, we would have to reinvent a new enemy because all of uh, all our industries economy the political system everything rests now on this and you see it look look how much money the arms manufacturer have uh, how much money they make they every almost every american top politician is on some board of some um, um, raytheon or some military company if they're not the, all of these companies uh, uh, arms and uh, arms manufacturers are funding the think tanks with and as every yeah. american political leader has is some uh, has some title some position in one of these think tanks so all the money goes through back to them and this is the whole economic political system which has been built up it's a yeah. built it is a Cold War legacy. And, and we that's, why, that's why this sucks so much. Russia and China cannot win against the militarism in the United States by military means, because that only creates the feedback loop that feeds the whole thing. So it's, it's really, a, it's, it's a, it's a, it, I don't know how to solve that, because what you need in order to, to take away the oxygen from these people is you need peace, <laughs> then you can you have you have the arguments to starve them of the of, of 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 the money they need in order to fight it. But even that didn't work during during the the post Cold War period. Um, but if no, you they... go if if you use military military means, you only feed that monster. Yeah. Oh, but there is no peace. There's just been too much propaganda. We rename peace. Uh, uh, so. <laughs> these days uh, peace means oh we need more nato nato's peace more nato is more peace more weapons and, yes 
Well, look, look, look at Orban today. For me, this is a huge shocker. He's uh, look what happened with the European Union. He went, you know, he went on this. Uh, they hold a rotating presidency of the European Council. So he went to Ukraine, went to Russia, went to China, then went to US to meet Trump, and he's uh, talking to all parties to figure out what what are the possibilities of peace. How did the EU respond? They're well, first of all, obviously condemning him because uh, this is. Russian, they say, and uh, second of all, the the punishing uh, Hungary as well now, um, and 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 this isn't possible. Also, this is also possible to have these insane policies, where diplomacy and uh, negotiations are criminalized simply because we also have complete garbage media, and uh, that's and, how and powerful mission. the warmongers are. They are insanely powerful. But uh, look in the media. Know. Read any papers about Orban now, or about the visit, yeah, why the EU is punching him. Oh, he went to Russia and China. They leave out the Ukraine part. What, now, ask yourself, when you see these newspapers, well, you read them, uh, and the, his diplomatic mission, why Why would you mention that he went to Moscow but not Kiev? Why Why would you say, point out that he met with Putin but not Zelensky? Why would why would any newspaper leave that out? And it's it's obvious because they, they're selling him. Oh, he's pro Putin. He goes to his master in Moscow and to Beijing, and those are the bad guys. And and of course, if you mention, oh yeah, we also went to Ukraine because you have to talk to both parties if you want peace. Yeah, no, then if, so so there's no rational arguments for this insane war policy and this war propaganda. So they just leave stuff out now. I mean, if. It's, uh, there's, it's, it's there's no there's crazy. no rational arguments for them anymore, but it is rational rational uh, rational for the warmongers to do that, or for the system which which gears to produce war to actually do that to itself yeah. because it is geared to produce war. And the question to the Russians is, how do you break through that? How do you break the logic um, if force itself actually feeds into it? Um, yeah, well, that's why that's the main question. I think <laughs> if you want to have, if they want to push a peace, uh, if the Russians want to push a peace, because the, my my question is always been: Do they go to the the direct directly to the Ukrainians or to the Americans? I always lean towards the Americans because that's where the decision making is made, and they have a huge power grab over over Ukraine uh, ever since two thousand fourteen. But but if the United States, you know, they don't have the incentives, they're not fighting with yeah. their own men, uh, they don't have any any, any interest. Uh, also, that would, uh, if you keep the war going, and NATO thrives. If the war comes to an end unfavorably, NATO could have a huge crisis. Why would you end the war? So I'm starting to think it's not possible through the US anymore either. It has to be through Ukraine. And this is why... Um, yeah, this is why it's uh, it's, it's a very difficult conflict to be solved, because uh, yeah, I don't think it can be solved. I don't think the Russians have many options left. Yeah. Uh, I know that the slogan we've been all taught to repeat is, "Oh, when Russia leaves Ukraine, the war is over." But that's not true. The war began, and this is why it's very difficult to argue against, because you can be then accused of carrying water for Putin. But the war did begin in two thousand fourteen with the coup, uh, and. And uh, they, they know that if they leave Ukraine, NATO will go in. Uh, we're saying that much to them you know, almost on a weekly basis. So so if they see this as an existential threat, they, they can't leave. So this war is either uh, framed as everything or nothing. That is to resolve finally the problem of NATO expansion on their border, or they lose everything. And uh, uh, you know, as, as Putin said as well, they might a uh, thousand year history of Russia could come to an end. So for them, it's all or nothing. And uh, when you're dealing with the world's largest nuclear power, this is not a good situation to put your, your adversary in. Uh, but we have some options on our side. So it has to come from the West or Ukraine. I do hope that in the end, some people in Kiev and Moscow and maybe Brussels hit the brakes after all, um, especially in the West. But um, I, I don't see it. I mean... Thank you very much for this discussion, Glenn. Um, I just yeah. really wanted to talk about this. So I very much appreciate you taking the time. And everybody, please follow Glenn Deason on his own YouTube channel. And you, you're you also writing. Is there any uh, Twitter people can follow you? Any other place to follow you? Uh, yeah, I have Substack, uh, Twitter, uh, yeah, YouTube, all, all of this. <laughs> and you will see him back on this channel as well. Glenn Deason, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.